Hey, everybody, welcome in. It is the Hutopia Football Podcast Tuesday edition. We are eight days into free agency. We are one day post a Texans new uniform leak. I had Nick Casario on my show on Sports Radio 610 on Monday. He sat down with me and Seth for about 45 minutes. It's the only public interview that Nick Casario has done since free agency. So we got a lot of good stuff from him that we'll get to. I'll direct you to the full interview. Um, I don't have the audio that will play on this podcast here, but if you want to listen to the full interview, it's up on uh, all of the different sports radio, 610 and Payne and Pendergast outlets that you can find on podcasts on our YouTube page, et cetera. Um, if you're a Texan fan, it's a, it's a really interesting 45 minutes or so. Um, and I'm going to give you my takeaways from that in just a second. It's a mailbag episode as well. You see that uh, address at the bottom of the uh, screen if you're watching on the stream, H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com. So uh, appreciate everybody who is continuing to send in questions and what has been one of the more interesting Texans off seasons in a long, long time. Um, so uh, H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com. We'll hit some mailbag questions as well here um, on, a, uh, on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, so let's start with the big news yesterday from the Texans has nothing to do with signing players. They did sign Mario Edwards Jr. today, Tuesday. So it looks like the defensive line room is um, is getting fuller. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. But the big thing that happened yesterday is actually pretty funny. Um, for those of you, I, I, I mean, I realize if you're a Texan fan and you listen to this podcast and there's like a 99% chance that you know the Texans are getting new uniforms um, for the 2024 season and beyond. They've been working diligently on this. A ton of people have been working behind the scenes on this. I don't, I don't know if people understand what a process it is to get a uniform change with the NFL. It is a long, laborious process, uh, especially when you're a Houston team that is trying to incorporate a lighter shade of blue that looks like oiler blue, and you have an owner up in Tennessee that gets finicky and litigious anytime somebody infringes on Columbia blue. Um, that's another thing that needs to get navigated, but it's a long process and it's finally over. And the Texans do have their, their new uniforms, which the plan has been to unveil them draft week, uh, April 20th, somewhere in the April 20th, 23rd, somewhere in that, that week, sometime in April, they want to unveil these new uniforms. So, um, it's been a long process. I've been in some of the meetings where they've kind of polled people. Like there's a fan council now for the Texans of about 50 fans. And I'm one of the media members that's part of the fan council. So I've been privy to some of the, the mock-ups and the designs and voted on some of the things as well. Uh, some of the fonts and the lettering and things like that. Um, so I've been privy to a, a decent chunk of the process. Um, and it's, it's been a, it's been a long one. Um, but they, they finally finished up the uniforms and they had a private showing of the uniforms, a private unveiling for a handful of different factions last Thursday. Um, they started by unveiling them to Texans employees, and then the Texans employees filed out of the, the venue we were at, and then the media, there's probably maybe 20 or 30 of us, filed in. We got to get a look, good look at them, um, and then we filed out, and then the fan council filed in and looked at them, about 50 people on the fan council. So they showed them to probably you know a total of maybe 100, 150 people, somewhere in there. Um, and, uh, they made us all sign non-disclosures before going in there, which is smart. They're trying to keep this thing under wraps and really make the unveiling a big deal when they get unveiled. Um, and, and I can tell you, these are not little tweaks they're making to the uniform as those of you seen the leaked pictures have seen. Um, it's not like a few years ago where they announced the uniform change and the only change was a tiny little Texans logo that they put on top of the name bar on the back of jerseys. Like you, you don't even notice that. This is a much, there are a whole lot of changes with the uniform coming, but they made a sign non-disclosure. So I can't be specific about the exact changes. Um, but we were all kind of choking. We were in there. I'm like, man, this is a lot of people that you hope keep quiet. They took our phones before we went in. So we weren't allowed to take pictures, which I had no problem with. Um, but as you can imagine, um, when you have that many potential points of failure, all it takes is one person to either sneak a camera in or somehow get a picture taken or whatever. And yesterday on Reddit, one of the four versions of Tex new Texans uniforms leaked online. And the reaction was, well, the reaction was, is this it? A lot of people asking 
me and others that were in that meeting, is this it? I'm like, that's definitely one of the uniforms we saw, but I understand the tepid, and I'm being kind, tepid reaction to the uniform because it was a picture of one of the like regular people. They had like four regular people models modeling these uniforms. Like none of them looked like NFL players and the uniforms fit kind of baggy on them. They looked like regular people. This picture in particular was not taken in the greatest of light. It was in the back corner of the warehouse that we were in where they were doing their actual shoot with the real players later on that evening. So the picture was not a flattering picture at all of the new uniform. So people were livid and they're anywhere from livid to just like pointing and laughing. It felt like something out of the Texans from like two years ago. Um, I really, I love what Cal McNair did. Um, the photo leaked. It was authentic. It was the uniform. It was the white Jersey with the blue pants and Cal McNair did a, a, a I thought a fantastic chess move. Um, which was to, um, sorry, I'm changing. There we go. Um, which was, um, he responded by actually posting an actual picture with Tank Dell and Nico Collins wearing the, the uniforms. And needless to say, the picture was much better lit. It was in a much uh, easier venue to look at. It was inside kind of this glass sort of cage they had where they were taking cool pictures. And they were real NFL players wearing the uniforms. The uniforms looked 100 times better on the two of them. Um, the big criticism I saw was that a lot of people think it looks too much like the Falcons uniforms, which I get. This is the font that I think the NFL is starting to move more towards the, the one that we saw the numbers, uh, on that leaked picture. Um, I'll say that the, the blue is a darker shade of blue on the Texans uniform, the new uniform, but it's not so blue that it looks black. And I thought it looked kind of black in those pictures. So I can understand the Falcons thing. I'll say this about the the uniforms, and this will be the last the last thing I mention about the uh, the uniform leak, only because I'm not really allowed to talk about much more. Um, I think the other three versions of the uniform that people will see, hopefully when they're supposed to see them in April, hopefully they don't leak again, or maybe maybe it'd be cool if they leaked again. Who knows? Um, the best is yet to come. I think the other versions of the uniform, the white on blue, was my least favorite. I like them all. But that was my least favorite. So the the other ones, I think, including two in particular, I think are awesome. So I think by and large, people are going to like them. There's always going to be people when it's uniforms that, that, that people don't like them. Um, but it represents, I think, another change with the Texans. And I think we really feel like we're embarking on a new era of Texans football. And I like that there's a new uniform to um, to go with it. And I think most importantly, at least according to people I talk to, the players really like them. Um I think they're going to sell a bunch of them. One in, one version in particular, I think they're just going to sell a ton of. So, um, so that's my take on the uniform leak. Main thing is I loved I loved how Cal McNair responded to it. I feel like if Jack Easterby were still in the building, there would have been this uh, manhunt to find out who leaked the photo, and then they would have just done something like switch back to the old uniforms and cancel the uniform release. I feel like we're operating in just a much more fun, commonsensical environment in the building over there. So that was really, really good to see. Um, now we interviewed Nick Casario uh, on Payne and Pendergast yesterday, Monday, we talked to him for about 40 or 45 minutes and I've got a handful of takeaways. I would recommend that you go listen to the entire interview. Again, it's uh, you can go to sports radio, 610.com. You can go to the Payne and Pendergast podcast page. You can go to our YouTube channel. There's clips of the interview floating around Twitter everywhere, not just from 610, but other Texan fans have, uh, I think really enjoyed the interview and certainly found parts of it to be really informative. My, my six biggest takeaways from the interview, um, it, he had, Nick had an interesting, an interesting thing that he said about players changing their minds, this free agency season, maybe more than others that he's experienced. And we know that when the legal tampering period begins on Monday, the contracts don't get officially signed till Wednesday afternoon. So the players that say verbally commit to going to a team and agreeing to a deal on Monday or Tuesday, they've got till Wednesday at three o'clock to change their minds. It happens very rarely, at least publicly, it happens very rarely. Rarely does a, a signing get announced that it's happening and a player goes back on it. We saw one this period. It was Eric Kendricks who had committed to sign to the 49ers. It got reported by everybody. And then he changed his mind and signed with the Dallas Cowboys. It happens very rarely 
to the point where it gets to be public knowledge. It sounded like from Nick that it was going on a lot more behind the scenes, that there were just players that were intimating one thing and then changing their mind and doing another. Nick didn't begrudge any of those players, but I think it set off a lot of speculation about who might have done that to the Texans. If there were a player that backed out on their word, who did it to the Texans? I know the afternoon guys on 610. Uh, Clint Sterner and Ron Hughley were speculating maybe it was Saquon Barkley, who was, seemed to be very in on being a Houston Texan throughout the, the lead up to free agency. And then he goes to the Eagles. I think it's more likely that if there were a specific instance in mind that Nick was referring to, and this is just me purely speculating, that it might have had to do with the uh, Eric Armstead sequence of events where Armstead we knew was going to get released by the 49ers. The Texans went to the Niners, and this is all, according to reports, agreed to a deal that would send Malik Collins to the 49ers for Eric Armstead. And that deal fell apart. The two sides had agreed to it, but when Daniil Hunter became available for the Texans, they shifted gears and went to signing Daniil Hunter, and his contract made it a little problematic to absorb Eric Armstead's contract. Eric Armstead makes seven, or was making at the time $17 million a year. Um, he actually still does, but now it's on a long-term deal with the Jags. Anyways, I think what may have happened, if, if there were anything that, that Nick's referring to with any degree of specificity, is that once that trade fell apart, the Niners went and released um, Eric Armstead. The Texans went ahead and traded Malik Collins to the Niners anyways for a seventh-round pick. And because of just the paltry return from Malik Collins, I do wonder if the Texans thought, well, we're going to just sign Eric Armstead anyways, and functionally the trade – will have gone down and will have actually picked up a seventh round pick in the process. Um, and maybe Eric Armstead went back on that on, if there was a wink, wink or a handshake deal, maybe he went back on it to sign what I think was an exorbitant deal with the Jacksonville Jaguars, three years, 51 million bucks. Again, that's just me purely speculating. If there is indeed anything specific behind what Nick said, he wasn't specific about anything, but, um, but he did talk about how this has been a much more fluid free agency period in terms of players kind of keeping their word for lack of a better term. So that was number one. Um, number two, he really loves the two defensive players that they signed, uh, the non hunter defensive stalwarts that they signed. I'll call he loves the Neil Hunter. No, that's obvious. Um, but the two other players they signed that kind of in that mid tier 10 or 11 million a year, Danico Autry, and uh, defensive end, uh, and linebacker um, uh, Aziz Alshire. He loves those two guys. He really loves Danico Autry. Find that clip if you can, um, because he he called him a badass. He called him a bad MF'er. He called him a junkyard dog. He said, if you go into a dark alley, you want Danico Autry with you. And he said, oh, by the way, he's a good football player too. Um, he loves Danico Autry. To the point where that sounds like a guy he's been trying to get on his team for a long, long time. So I'm excited to see Danico Autry play in this D'Amico Ryan's defense. As far as Al Shire goes, he revealed that they did try to get him last year in free agency. He went to Tennessee instead. Um, and that he called him a football playing Jesse, which gave a lot of us um, David Cully flashbacks. But that's okay. It's a compliment. So really likes... Aziz Alshire as well. So big fans of both of those guys. I think Texan fans should be very excited about those two players. Alshire, maybe an upgrade over Blake Cashman. And um, and then Danico Autry. I don't know that he's a direct upgrade over anybody. Danico Autry is kind of a unicorn in this whole thing. I look at Daniil Hunter as the upgrade over John Grenard. Danico Autry is a defensive end who can bump inside and play defensive tackle. There's really nobody he's replacing or really nobody with that skill set that has been on the Texans recently. So I can't wait to see how D'Amico Ryans uses D'Amico Autry. And I hope we all survive having a D'Amico coaching a D'Amico. Um, number three, the trade down to 42 that took place on Friday um, appears to be the continuation of what's going to be a very fluid approach to the draft. In fact, Nick even said they may move back up into the first round. I, the one thing I feel confident in it is they, they probably won't pick at 42. They may move back on draft night. They may move back again before the draft. I think it's more likely they move up. You know, somebody slips down the board and Nick, who is who is not scared at all to maneuver around in the draft, um, that they could move up. But it does seem like if they do end up picking at 42, they plunk themselves down into a 
into an area of the draft where they feel like there's going to be a lot of value and a lot of players that fit what they're looking for. I think the one thing you need to know about this draft is that, the, and I think John Harris even said this la- last week or whenever we had Johnny on uh, a couple weeks ago, is that there's a lot of offensive linemen, quarterbacks, elite level receivers, other specific players like Brock Bowers, who the Texans might not be in on. There's a bunch of positions that that the Texans, I don't think, would even be in on those players if they were picking, you know, 15th, let alone 23rd, where they were before they moved down. So it's going to push a lot of guys who are probably pretty high up the Texans board down to the Texans, so much so that they feel as good about getting a player potentially at 42 quality-wise that they would get at 23 because they, there's a big group of players. Um, I think what I think the next tier of wide receiver is something the Texans are looking at. I think anything on the defensive line is fair game, particularly the interior of the defensive line. Um, and I think cornerback is probably another position they're going to be looking at in the draft, depending on what they do in free agency. But the Knicks, Nick made it pretty clear, like they they may not in all likelihood pick at 42. They may move back into the first round and they did it now just because they were comfortable with what they were getting back. They got back an extra second round pick. Number four, they did their due diligence on Joe Mixon. That was a big question I had. Joe Mixon, who, of course, had an incident at Oklahoma in 2014 where he hit a woman. Um, Reportedly, the woman called him a racial slur. Um, Either way, you know, you can't hit a woman. Um, So uh, Joe Mixon was suspended for a year at Oklahoma and then obviously came into the NFL with all kinds of question marks, with uh, character question marks. Um, he's been, he's been a model citizen in Cincinnati since he got there in 2017. He's been a three-time captain, been a good player for them. Nick said they absolutely did their due diligence on the stuff at Oklahoma, even though it was 10 years ago, they did their due diligence. They had done their due diligence, Nick in new England. And then the Texans obviously did their due diligence in 2017 on Joe Mixon. Um, so they're perfectly comfortable with Joe Mixon. Otherwise, I don't think they would have given him a three-year contract extension. They wouldn't have traded for him in the first place. Number five, seems like Nick is very optimistic about Kenyon Green and where he is physically right now. Um, that uh, Kenyon Green, it, it was very clear because I asked him about Tank Dell, Kenyon Green, and Titus Howard. And Dylan Horton too, but that's kind of a separate thing with Dylan. You know, Dylan Horton's coming back from, a, from stage four lymphoma. Uh, it's different than coming back from from knee surgery uh, or a broken leg like Tank Dell. Um, it felt like to me, and this isn't just Kenyon, but I felt like with Tank and Kenyon and certainly Titus, who I think his recovery was going to probably take him up to training camp from his injury. Um, they're going to, they're, it sounds like they're going to take it slow with these guys. Even though you see videos out there now of, of, of Tank Dell running around with his personal trainer and whatnot, Nick even alluded to don't, don't, um, you know, be careful of the reports that you see out there about how these guys are doing physically. Um, but it sounds like they're going to take it slow with these guys in terms of recovery. And it's, it's certainly through the early parts of the spring where you're really not doing anything super physical. There's no reason to have guys running around if they don't need to. I'm anxious to see what Kenny Green looks like. I'm anxious to see if his body type has changed at all since he's been out for a year. He almost, it's almost like he got a red shirt year this year. Um, in his sophomore year as an NFL player. Um, so did he go back? Did he you know, kind of reconstruct his body? How healthy is he? Did he do some soul searching? Because even when he played, he wasn't a very good player. So uh, I'm rooting for Kenyon Green. I hope that works out. And number six, it sounds like to me that, that Nick Casario still has hope for Damian Pierce, who was the face of the franchise this time a year ago because they hadn't drafted C.J. Stroud or Will Anderson. And Derek Stingley Jr. was just an injury-prone cornerback. and um, Damian Pierce was coming off a near thousand yard season and you know, the big personality that he has. Um, so he was the guy at the front of the group of players on the, on the season ticket promo. And at the end of this past season, he wasn't getting any snaps. Uh, Devin Singletary was getting all the snaps at tailback him and Dario Gumbawale. So, um, Nick was very positive about Damian Pierce when we asked about him. Um, and, uh, He's going to get a shot right now. He's RB two. We'll see what happens. Um, it's, you know, Joe Mixon's going to be the starter. I think they're going out and getting Joe Mixon and even more so extending Joe Mixon probably says more about where they are with Pierce than maybe what Nick was saying. Cause I don't think Nick's going to come on and throw anybody under the bus. Um, but for now, Damian Pierce is going to get, 
to be part of the rotation in the backfield. Pierce himself told me and Clint Sterner in the postgame show uh, following the loss to Cleveland that he was having a real trouble adapting to this offense. So, um, so Damian Pierce, um, still hope for him. All right, so those are my Casario interview takeaways. Uh, if you want to listen to the whole interview, go to sportsradio610.com, go to the Payne and Pendergast podcast, or go to our YouTube page, and I'm sure we've got, uh, we've got it all up there for you as well. Um, let's get to the mailbag. H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com is where you can send in your questions and your comments. I've got about a half dozen of them here, uh, so let's rapid fire a few of these. Um, I'm going to start with my guy, Joe Q. Joe Q, the frequent emailer to the show, and I appreciate them all. How would you analyze the swap of Grenard for Hunter in terms of production and contract implications? I think the Texans, I, I think they won big on this swap out. And it's interesting that you, we can really almost look at it as a trade because Grenard goes to Minnesota from Houston. Hunter comes to Houston from Minnesota. So it really does function kind of like a trade. Um between the two teams. Hell, if you want to throw Cashman in there, maybe you look at it like Cashman and Grenard for Daniil Hunter. But the question is just swapping these two out position for position. Hunter is going to take over opposite Will Anderson. Um, I think it's a huge win for the Texans. I think that um, it's a risky deal for Grenard in Minnesota just because of the health issues that he's had over the course of his career. I'm always skeptical of a guy who's only big season is in a contract year. Not that Grenard has bad football character or anything like that, but I think it's worth noting. Um, I think this is the biggest thing, and this is something that Seth Payne's pointed out on Payne and Pendergast, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., Sports Radio 610, is that um, Grenard and Hunter, Hunter had uh, 16 and a half sacks, Grenard had 12 and a half. So there's already a degree of productivity that Hunter hits that Grenard did not. The big thing is Hunter has nearly double the number of QB pressures as Jonathan Grenard. He just causes more havoc. He causes more pain for an offense, an opposing offense. So um, I love the contract. I think they're basically both like two-year contracts. Hunter's is an actual two-year contract that's mostly guaranteed for $48 million. Um, the Texans have the cap space to absorb that type of deal. That's the deal that's really, I think, put them over the top with a lot of the national people in terms of where they view the Texans and the pantheon of teams in the NFL. Grenard's deal is four years, $76 million, but it's $42 million guaranteed. So that's basically like a two-year deal for $21 million a year. You, you, can get out, you can get out from underneath that deal after a couple of years. So I, I view the contracts as being fairly equal in terms of just the weight that you're carrying. Hunter's a little more expensive, but I think the payoff in terms of productivity – and I think the impact for Will Anderson, having an elite, elite edge rusher on the other side and a true vet, like a Daniil Hunter who's been in the league since, I think, 2016, I think is going to pay huge dividends for Will Anderson. Um, so that's my feeling on that. JR and Spicewood says, I feel like defense has been the primary focus of free agency for the Texans. Do you think that could mean offense will dominate the upcoming draft? Would love to see them get a stud receiver at – at 23, when JR sent this email, they were still picking at 23 or move up to get Bowers if he slides. Well, I think the Brock Bowers dream, which has been my dream, if they're still sitting at 42, is over. Um, so he's not going to get anywhere close to 42. I don't, I doubted he was going to get close to 23. Um, Bowers, the tight end out of Georgia, for those who don't know, really, really good player. Um, so I think that's over. Um, I think as far as the draft goes, um, I think there's a couple of things they're looking for, and I don't know that they're necessarily looking for one at 42 and one at 59. I think it's going to depend how the board falls. But I think if they're prioritizing things, it's defensive line, particularly the interior of the defensive line. A lot of people excited about the possibility at 42 of them landing to landing to Vondre Sweat from Texas. We'll see about that. Or a receiver. And I think them being now at 42 and 59 as opposed to 23 and 59, they've got two picks kind of in a, you know, sort of a, a close proximity to each other. I think it increases the chances of them looking for a wide receiver. Um, I think the fact that they swung and missed on Keenan Allen and on a trade for him um, shows that they see receiver as an area of need, maybe specifically a slot type. Um, but I think, I, I don't, I don't know that I'm going to pigeonhole one side or the other when it comes to the draft. I think they've got specific needs. 
I think they've shown, though, that if there's a player they feel is best available, regardless of position, that they're willing to do that. So um, I don't know if it's a cop-out answer. I just don't know that the Texans – I don't know that the Texans approach the draft where they, it provides clear answers to anything. You know what I mean? The clearest thing I can say is I think they're going to get weapon, uh, another weapon for C.J. Stroud. Put it this way. If they stay at 42 and 59, A, I'll be shocked. But if they do, I would, I would bet – money that one of those will be a wide receiver and the other will be a defensive lineman. That would be my feeling on that with cornerback kind of sitting on the fringe. All right. Troy asks, are the Texans cool with Damian Pierce running as RB two this season? I just mentioned that um, in my takeaways from Nick, uh, if he looks like he's gotten the offense, then yeah. If it's the same Damian Pierce we had last season, then no, <laughs> they, they signed Devin Singletary to be a complimentary back last year, a third down back guy who get a few touches a game. And he had to turn into a bell cow for them because Damian Pierce just wasn't usable at the end of the year. So I, I think they'd love to have Damian on this team. I think Texan fans would love to have Damian on this team. Damian's got to prove he can play in this offense. So I think they're cool with him at RB two. You know, I, they may, maybe they wait till training camp to supplement the running back room. My guess is they're going to probably bring in another running back. I would guess maybe they draft a running back on day three. I don't think they do it with 42 59 and maybe third round maybe eight, with the 86 pick um that they have in the third round but um i think if he's picked up the offense they they would love to have damian Pier he got him left for two years on his rookie deal still that would be awesome if he could get this thing where would nico collins go in a redraft of the 2021 draft that's from matthias i love redrafts okay full disclosure i'm a big redraft guy so I actually, I saw this question and I pulled up the 2021 draft. Now the 2021 draft is probably best known right now for having the biggest collapse bust fest of quarterback picks in the top 15 that we've seen maybe ever. Trevor Lawrence is the only one that's done anything remotely productive. Um, Zach Wilson is getting ready to either get traded or cut. And the other three first round quarterbacks uh, in that draft, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, and Mac Jones are all on other teams as backups now. They've all been traded. The league is, as a whole now seems to be punting on quarterbacks earlier. If they feel like, okay, this guy just is never going to work out. Why are we burning daylight? Kenny Pickett got traded too. It, there's a very real chance that the Texans, since 2020, since that draft, which had Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert and Tua, um, there's a very real chance the Texans may have drafted the only good quarterback since that draft. And I'm including Trevor Lawrence. I don't know if Trevor Lawrence is good. I know he's talented. I don't know if he's truly good. Um, there's more evidence that he's not good than that he is good. There's plenty. There is evidence that he's good. There's way more evidence that he, he might not be good. So as far as a redraft goes of the 2020, because Nico Collins went 89th overall, and now he might be one of the top 10 or 12 wide receivers in all of football. The players that I have that for sure I think would have gone based on knowledge now, because we've got when you do a redraft, it's based on what you now know. And we now know Nico Collins is capable of being a number one wide receiver. I think Micah Parsons is probably the number one pick in that draft. Penne Sewell goes very high in that draft. Amon Ross St. Brown has been more productive than Nico, even though the, the dimensions are different. He was a fourth round pick. Amon Ross St. Brown, he's 112th pick overall. But I'll put him ahead of Nico just because he's been productive. Um, Jamar Chase, I think goes ahead of Nico Collins, Creed Humphrey, I think goes ahead of Nico Collins, Patrick Sertan, because he plays that premium corner position and he's been very good. I think goes ahead of Nico. Then you start to get into players that you can debate about, you know, like Devonte Smith, top 10 pick, been productive, kind of a skinny little bird leg guy though. Nico's a big strapping dude. Jalen Waddle probably goes ahead of Nico, too. So I'm up to about eight guys, I think, eight or nine guys. I think I'll throw Trevor Lawrence in there just because there might be a team that, in, that, if they're redrafting in the top 10, feels like, oh, man, that year he had with Urban Meyer, and, you know, that, that, it's almost like he lost a year. He's really only a two-year guy. Trevor Lawrence is talented enough to where, okay, I'll concede he might still go in the top 10 of a redraft. After that, man, I don't know. Like, I think... You know, Landon Dickerson, good interior offensive lineman, just got a big contract extension from Philadelphia. Um, Rayshon Slater's done some good things for the Chargers. Um, but, man, like like Travis Etienne ain't going ahead of Nico Collins, you know? Um, 
Kyle Pitts, is he going ahead of Nico still? Maybe. Maybe. Hufanga, the safety from San Francisco, but he's hurt now. He's He missed the season last year. I think Nico's for sure top 15 in a redraft of 2021. And I think there's only like seven or eight guys that I would say with certainty would go ahead of him. That's how good Nico Collins, in my opinion, has become. And I'm just kind of skimming down the draft board here um, according to approximate value on pro football reference. I think the other interesting thing, Davis Mills might be the second best quarterback from that draft class in 2021. And I don't even think that's a hot take. He might be the second best quarterback from that draft class in 2021. Davis Mills, Trevor Lawrence, Davis Mills, and then a bunch of dudes who are on different teams now. Because Davis Mills was drafted. You have that chunk up in the top 15, and then there were no quarterbacks drafted until Davis Mills, Kellen Mond, and Kyle Trask all went within a few picks of each other. Kellen Mond and Kyle Trask aren't good. Davis Mills at least has, you know, won like four games in the NFL. Um, again, not the highest bar to clear to be the second best quarterback in that draft class. Probably Justin Fields, if I'm being honest. But Davis Davis might be third. All right. Um, love the redraft concept. Thank you, Matthias. Appreciate the email. A um, couple more. Jimmy and Baytown. We know the opponents are going to be more difficult for the Texans next season, but what are the other elements of the schedule besides the actual teams they play that could make things more difficult for them? Um, good question. I listed six things that could make things a lot more difficult than just the caliber of the opponent. The Texans play a really, really hard set of teams next year and a, a bunch of good quarterbacks. The Texans are ninth on the odds board for the Super Bowl right now, post the first week of free agency, tied with the Packers at 22 to 1 to win the Super Bowl. There are six teams that are in the top 10 that the Texans play next year, including the Packers, who they're tied with. Kansas City, Baltimore, Buffalo, Dallas, Detroit. So it's a hard schedule. Three of those games are at home, three are on the road. The things that could make the schedule more difficult than just the opponents, one, I think they're going to have more primetime games. So that's that that's difficult, if, especially if they're on the road, but it messes with your schedule, especially when they're on Thursday night or Monday night. And it's a short week, um, which leads me into point number two, the consistency they got with last year's schedule where every game until the final game of the season was noon Sunday. What a luxury that is. Now it means you're a bad football team. So, you, you know, that's the benefit of being a bad football team is you know what time you're getting to bed every Saturday and Sunday. But um, they, there's going to be a real lack of consistency in their schedule. How does D'Amico Ryans handle that? The potential for cold weather games is number three for me. Cold weather games, potentially in Green Bay, in New York, against the Jets, and in New England, against the Patriots. So you've got three potential, and add in Tennessee if you want to. That's, you know, if they get a Tennessee December game like they did last year, that was cold weather. So I think cold weather games in tough environments, especially Green Bay, that's number three. Number four, the potential to open the season at Kansas City, and God knows what else in the early part of the schedule. The last time the Texans opened the season uh, on a Thursday night was against Kansas City in Kansas City in 2020. And the first four games that year in 2020 were Kansas City, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and Minnesota. I think all of them were playoff teams, or most of them were. All I know is Bill O'Brien went 0-4 and was fired after that game. So whatever comes early in the season, that potential. Now, we don't know that they're playing Kansas City in the opener. Just the potential exists for that. These are all things. Until we see the actual schedule and the when and where of all the games, these are just things that could happen. Um, number five, a London game. And I think, they, I think they're going to get a London game, either against Minnesota or Jacksonville. That's my purely a guess. But a London game messes with things. And finally, they could play the Cowboys in Dallas on Thanksgiving. So that's another. That's, that's not the easiest environment, although the Cowboys have rolled over more than their fair share of times on Thanksgiving. So I think those are the things that could make the schedule a whole lot harder. Last one here. This is from Brian. This is my emailer who emailed. Oh, by the way, thank you uh, to Jimmy in Baytown for that last one. Um, Brian is the one who emailed me about the dynasty, the New England Patriots docu-series that just ended uh, last Friday on Apple TV, final episodes 9 and 10. Um, asked me, what, what's my final grade? My final grade for the 10-episode docu-series, The Dynasty, is A-. It's an A- minus for me. Um, really good. Quality of the footage, the extent of the footage, I thought it flowed really well. I think the best episode, Aaron Hernandez, that episode is one of the best episodes of any 
team sports related docu series that I've ever seen. It was really, really good. Um, just very, very well done. Uh, so um, a minus the things that disappointed me, nothing major, but there were four things missing from the dynasty that I wish there had been either addressed or more of. I'm going to start with one selfishly. My friend Ted Johnson was a great linebacker for the New England Patriots. He was a captain of their team. He was on that team for a decade. You would not know that Ted Johnson was a New England Patriot if you watched that docuseries. And that pisses me the hell off. So that's number one, because I know the Patriots had a big hand in this thing. So stop trying to pretend Ted Johnson didn't exist, jackasses. Okay? That's number one. Number two, the stolen the Tom Brady jersey that got stolen at, from NRG Stadium at the, the Super Bowl they played here uh, against Atlanta back in 2017. If you remember, Tom Brady's jersey got stolen by a journalist from Mexico and got taken all the way to Mexico. The FBI got involved in that whole thing and ended up recovering it. It was crazy. And I remember the old police chief, Art Acevedo in Houston, took credit for that, took, took credit for finding the jersey. And I, somebody who's a close friend, who's in security for the Patriots, a family friend, who's with the FBI for a number of years, told me, like, no, they, they didn't go get it. They were the ones who ended up with it in their hands on camera, but it was the FBI who went to Mexico and got it. Um, I revealed that on the air, and I don't think Art Acevedo really liked me after that, but he's not the police chief here anymore. So unless there's some Art Acevedo people that listen to this podcast, I can uh, I can drive five miles an hour over the speed limit without fear of uh, fear of reprisal, I think. I think. All right, so that was so we were missing Ted Johnson, we're missing a stolen jersey. No mention of Antonio Brown on the New England Patriots. Zero, zero mention. He was a New England Patriot, New England people, for one game. No mention of picking him up, and he was on the team in the framework of the time that this documentary covered. So no mention of Antonio Brown. Finally, I'm not surprised about this one, but. No mention of Robert Kraft getting a little handy at the uh, at the uh, uh, Orchids of Asia Spa in Florida, um, caught on camera. You know, just letting off a little steam, man. Uh, so no mention of that. Not surprised. I I am I'm shocked that there wasn't at least a little mention of Ted Johnson in there in the early years, or at least show him making a play because he made plenty. I'm shocked the stolen jersey wasn't mentioned. Shocked. Uh, Moderately surprised, no mention of Antonio Brown, because that was in 2019 where the whole thing started to kind of unravel. Um, and I'm zero surprised that there was no mention of Kraft getting a rub and tug. Um, but it would have been funny if they did. All right, so that's my grade. A minus on the dynasty. Appreciate the uh, appreciate the question, Brian, on that one. All right, um, a reminder, if you want to email a question, mailbag at gmail.com. mailbag at gmail.com is where you can send your emails, um, uh, we'll have a guest on Thursday, still working on who, but there will be an episode on Thursday this week. So do that thing. Subscribe, rate, review, hit that subscribe button. You'll get the podcast sent to you automatically right to whatever device it is you use for your podcast. And rate and review it. That always helps us as well here on the Utopia Football Podcast. So for uh, Anthony Irwin, who is my producer, does a great job getting the pod out to each and every one of you. Uh, I'm Sean Pendergast. A reminder, listen to Payne and Pendergast, Sports Radio 610, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. weekdays on Sports Radio 610. Um, we're out of time. We'll see you all on Thursday. Until then, have a great week, everybody.